100 years ago, women and men across the United States achieved a monumental win for the women's rights movement. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified, extending suffrage to women. In honor of the United States Suffrage Centennial, we invite you to jump aboard the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour. The Suffrage Special Train will make eight virtual whistle stops. We will visit Spokane, Pasco, Ellensburg, Vancouver, Bellingham, Seattle, Tacoma, and reach the end of the line in Olympia on August 26th. Join us as the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour winds through Washington once again. The women of Clark County have long wielded significant economic and political power. From the early indigenous Chinook and Cowlitz nations through the suffrage movement to today, Clark County women have made a name for themselves in the fight for women's suffrage and later in the ongoing push for equality. The Vancouver Methodist Episcopal Church was the center of women's progressive issues in Clark County and the launching point for much of the suffrage work locally. First preaching sermons at Fort Vancouver in 1834, Jason Lee's early ministry with its focus on welcoming people of all backgrounds and equality helped solidify women's positions within the community. A ladies' industrial society began as early as 1865 to pursue fundraising and support the church's mission. The church would go on to welcome Susan B. Anthony as a speaker there in 1896. By 1877, the first Clark County Women's Christian Temperance Association formed in Vancouver, Washington. It held close ties with many members of the church, including suffragist Elizabeth Holbrook Durgin. Elizabeth took charge as treasurer of the Women's Sanitary Society and superintendent of the WCTU. Her work, with the support of her husband, local civil leader G.W. Durgin, strengthened the WCTU's influence in the county. A branch was established in Washougal through the Willamette Valley Association of Congregational Churches in 1886. Frances Fanny Mole Gibbon and her husband, Company Commander General John Gibbon, moved into a house on Officers Row in 1885, where they entertained visitors ranging from senators to presidents. Fanny and her two daughters were well-known suffragists. In support of his wife and daughter's efforts, General Gibbon penned an article in Harper's Weekly titled, In Defense of Women's Right to Vote. Not long after women were initially granted and eventually lost the right to vote in 1884, Judge Benjamin Denning and a group of progressives established the Clark County Equal Rights Association, or CCERA. Its objective was to extend women's voting to the rest of the nation and promote the encouragement and assistance of women in the exercise of the right of suffrage and for other purposes. 13 of the 31 signers were women, and many were members of the Vancouver Methodist Episcopal Church. CCERA wrote a constitution establishing that anyone could become a member and be elected into a leadership position after paying dues of $1 and signing on, regardless of gender. Judge Dennison was elected its first president with nationally recognized WCTU leader Dr. Ella Whipple as secretary and Mary J. Hayden, an ardent suffragist and friend of Abigail Scott Dunaway as treasurer. Dr. Ella Whipple was from a family who prized education and long supported suffrage. Her mother, Charlotte Lambert Whipple, was said to have strong suffrage leanings and shocked her new husband, Samuel, by speaking publicly on women's rights prior to moving to Washington from Illinois. The Whipples settled on a land claim in Ridgefield, but moved to Vancouver once the children were ready to attend the Vancouver Seminary School. Ella went on to graduate with a BA from Willamette University. After teaching for 10 years, Ella returned to Willamette to attend medical school. Ella practiced medicine in Vancouver from 1883 to 1888. She also served as superintendent of schools and principal of Normal Institute, or Teachers College, and was Clark County's first woman public health official. A committed temperance and suffrage worker, 
Ella occupied nearly all the leadership positions in the Vancouver chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Association and at the Methodist Episcopal Church at one time or another. This was in addition to her time with the Clark County Equal Rights Association. Between 1883 and 1887, the four years when women in Washington Territory could vote, Ella twice represented Clark County Republicans at their county and state conventions. Women in Clark County were connected to national trends, traveling back and forth to the nearby town of Portland, Oregon for suffrage activities. In 1885, a large Portland delegation attended the 4th of July suffrage parade in Vancouver, organized by the Equal Rights Association. In addition, publisher of the New Northwest newspaper and well-known suffragist, Abigail Scott Dunaway, was heavily involved in the suffrage fight in Vancouver. Considered abrasive, she had trouble getting along with the younger and more conservative suffragists of Vancouver, who allied with the new woman ideology of moral and social responsibility. They disagreed about Dunaway's still-hunt organizing method, which relied on appealing to men for their support of women's issues. The tension would result in the dissolution of the Waimo Dossis, short for Wives, Mothers, Daughters, and Sisters Vancouver chapter. Waimo Dossis reorganized as the Athenaeum Club, whose less controversial focus was to deliver lectures and support women's ability to vote. Margaret Hayes Hall was a University of Washington class president and secretary of the Washington College Equal Suffrage League, which campaigned across the state for the National American Woman Suffrage Association. After moving to Vancouver in 1910 and marrying lawyer Charles Hall, Margaret joined a group of other society women who registered to vote when it became legal in January 1911. She joined Athenaeum in 1911 to continue her work supporting women's voting rights and suffrage. The work of these individuals and the groups they led were crucial in women gaining the right to vote in Washington state and at the national level. Their leadership and hard work ushered in a new era of women as powerful political leaders, including such notables as Dr. Louisa Wright, Ella Wintler, and Elizabeth Sterling. Dr. Louisa Van Vliet Spicer Wright was Camus's first woman doctor and nearly became the city's first woman mayor. Although she refused to run for the position, Dr. Wright lost by only one vote. Her leadership and position in the community helped pave the way for many women in the Camas washougal area. It wouldn't be until 1983 that Camas would elect Nan Henriksen as their first woman mayor. Elizabeth K. Ward Sterling arrived in Vancouver with her husband and stepson in 1900. She taught at the Central School and after earning her BA from the University of Washington in 1906, later taught at the Franklin School. Sterling was elected Clark County School Superintendent in 1911, the first woman elected to the post after statehood, and women were granted suffrage. She served until 1916. In 1920, Elizabeth became the Deputy County Clerk of Vancouver. She also founded the local chapters of Delta Kappa Gamma and the American Association of University Women. Ella Wintler graduated from University of Washington and taught English, German, and Social Studies at Vancouver High School for 34 years. Wintler was first drawn into public affairs as a member of the Vancouver City Planning Commission. In 1938, she began a 20-year career of legislative service to the state. As a representative, Wintler was known for putting the needs of her constituents before party. She was a staunch activist for vocational and recreational programming at Vancouver's Schools for the Blind and Deaf, as well as improvement in the treatment of patients at state mental institutions, reforms in the state penal system, and rehabilitation for juvenile and young offenders. As a highly respected legislator, Representative Wintler served as Speaker Pro Tempore during the 1963 session. In nearly every session of her legislative tenure, she requested and received positions on the Appropriations and Education Committees. So what do women in Clark County think about the importance of the vote now, 100 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment? Uh, voting to me means a sense of contribution to the community. 
and it's one of the most fundamental contributions that anyone can make. Not everyone can volunteer, not everyone can volunteer at their schools, but they certainly can vote as to who sits on the school board. They can vote as to who represents their voice at the community level. Um, I think that there's a lot of, um, people get distracted by what happens at the federal level, but they don't really understand how important it is to be uh, that basic contribution at the community level. And so that to me is a fundamental contribution. To me, voting really is a opportunity to have your voice heard. And for me, it really matters locally because sometimes I feel like my voice can get lost with big national elections. And when you really narrow into your local elections, I think that that's where you can make the biggest difference. I think it's never been more important than it is now. And it's been very heartening for me over the past three to four years to see the young voters, young people in this country really rise up and kind of find their voice and be aware of the power that they wield through, you know, everything from protesting to being able to vote. And I've seen it firsthand through my children, their friends, um, and through social media. And it's, it's really been amazing to see that understanding and that growth. And I'm really hoping that we can, you know, see that participation this fall and th that the youth were really going to come together and make that happen. Voting means to me, um, I find that that's the first level of activism that folks can take part in. Um, we all have many different opinions and views about the way our society is and the laws that make it that way. And I feel that if you, you know, you may not know what it means to get involved in a whole movement, you may not know what it means to go charge the streets, all these things, but the first thing that you can do to activate your activism and to really uh, use your power to make change in your community is to vote. Voting to me has opened a whole new world. I actually was not a voter in my younger years. I was never taught about the importance of voting and in the area where I grew up, um, voting wasn't emphasized. So now that I've matured a little bit more and seen the oppression, seen how laws impact me, impact you, impact everybody who is not able to vote, I believe that voting now is a matter of life and death. I believe my vote counts. I have seen times when there is an administration whose ideas I don't believe in. And so I have gone to the voting polls in order to change that. And I'm old enough that in my time, I have seen that you can vote out a person or an issue or an administration that you don't believe in, and you can vote for someone that you do. So I've seen it happen in action. Voting essentially means to me is how you participate in community. Um, I'm an anthropologist by training and it's an essential human behavior. We express our opinions either quantitatively or qualitatively and voting kind of mixes both of that. You have to combine uh, conversation with an expression of an opinion. Um, and I think where that carries out into today is that the size of our populations are not manageable on a committee level. So we have to choose leaders to speak for us. Um, and we have to hold them accountable to what we ask them to speak to. And that's one of the ways we engage in this process. Um, culture is cyclical and it's recursive. And voting is one of the most essential ways to participate in any type of community that we're part of in this modern era. 
Um, we are accustomed to voting in our daily lives. We vote with what coffee shops we attend, what cars we buy. Humans vote with their money very easily in the United States. However, we don't always uh, vote as passionately with our actual time and paying attention to specific election measures or candidates or issues that are facing us, um, which is unfortunate. Um, it's very funny, but most of the people that I have found throughout my life that they don't like to vote, they have a very strong opinion about how the government is run, uh, positive or negative. And I ask them, how do you vote? And when they say, oh, I didn't vote because I didn't want to vote for this candidate or the other candidate, and they don't realize that the lack of voting is what creates this disconnect between them and the elected officials. My advice for people that are feeling kind of disconnected from voting and feel that their vote doesn't count or their voice isn't heard, I would highly encourage you to get involved with your local elections. The local elections are what set the pace for the state and federal. When um, people in the community vote for the representatives that we have, like city council, for uh, mayor, you know, different representatives, I think we set the pace for what we want to see in our local community that represents exactly who we are, what we want. I think that if you want to make that first level of change where you really get to see how that vote really carried through and maybe it'll inspire you to you know, vote more routinely. I think that you should really participate in your local elections. Look at, you know, who's on your county council, who's on your city council, who is advocating for you and what are they advocating for. Local government has things that matter to us every day. The roads matter to us every day. We have law enforcement, which affects us every day. It matters to us how our law enforcement people are trained. So I think in every way, I would say to somebody who said, gee, I don't know whether that matters. I would pull out examples like I've talked with you before. I think I would be very persuasive, by the way. If somebody gave me an attempt at that conversation, I would dive in to talk with them about why voting locally really matters. I think my experiences um, when it comes to why I want to vote is because I've experienced myself some things. But when I think about my experience, I think about my experience and the stories that I hear and the lives around me that impact me the most. So that means thinking about my elders, thinking about you know my grandparents, thinking about um, my mom, my aunts, um, all these people that heavily influence my life, that's what I think about when I think about how those experiences have impacted me because their experiences are my experiences. And I know that, you know, my, my mom can tell you about the stories that she has from having inequities within her school system, inequities within the classroom and different, um, and when you trace back that history and you look at um, the different superintendents that were put into place, the different local laws that were passed that enabled things like that to happen, well, that then impacts my experience. That impacts the way she was raised and that impacts the way that she raised me. And so the way that she raises me is gonna be a little bit different just based off of um, the lack of access that she had to items and making sure that I have the access to those items, but also letting me know what um, what occurred to make her so um, serious about injustices. And so that influences me because I'm able to identify things that aren't correct but can be easily uh, impacted and changed um, by me 
participating in a local election? I think one of the strangest things about being an indigenous person that is also an American is that when you participate in the voting process, you're still, to a certain extent, participating in the nation that occupies you. And that makes everything foundationally a bit skewed, because in order to enact change, you do have to participate in the process. Additionally, Native Americans were granted the right to vote very, very late in the game. Uh, we were one of the last to get enfranchised with our votes. So, there's a weird dichotomy in our communities about whether we even should vote. Do we participate in this? Um, so that being said, I am definitely one of those you must vote to participate because fundamentally, again, it's a human behavior. It's how we move our communities forward. And voting is an indigenous practice. In the Pacific Northwest, it's an indigenous practice. One of the things that's beautiful about Northwest Coast peoples is that if you didn't believe in the leadership of your household or your community. When a house got large enough to split, you could take your resources and your labor and move into a different house. You could choose to move to a different village. And that is a fundamental lived reality on this landscape we inhabit today. That voting has taken place with people's feet um, since time immemorial in Clark County. It, it is a voting practice in this landscape. And it only makes sense to continue that through to the contemporary era. Women and the right to vote goes beyond choosing people to represent us in public office. It, um, it speaks to our ability to receive equal pay for equal work. It speaks to our ability to receive equal health care. Um, to not be sexually harassed at work. It, it goes so far beyond just quote unquote average politics that it's incumbent upon all of us, men and women, to ensure that those rights remain inalienable and that we remain educated and constantly striving to seek out those candidates who align with our values in that arena and to take that very seriously. Voting should be part of a family conversation and, um, and talk about the issues and the proposals and the candidates and regardless of political affiliation, to vote according to the principles, the values, and the things that uh, families want to see for themselves and their neighbors and the community. I remember becoming an adult and thinking like, oh, okay, voting is something that you do, but it's not something that you share. And I've come to learn that I didn't want my daughter to grow up that way. I felt that it was important to share um, me voting, having her see me vote and use my ballot, which is a great thing about mail-in ballots. Uh, they can, we sit down at the dinner table and I talk to her about um, what I'm thinking and the things that are on that current ballot and so she has the opportunity to see like what it looks like to actively look. And I don't try to steer her one way or another and say like, this is why I think this way. It's more just like showing her like, this is the pamphlet and this is how you can see different sides and you can do research and how I go onto different websites to see uh, um, about different issues that are on the ballot that year and the importance of really knowing what you're going to vote for. I think that one of the most amazing things that has happened in, I would say, the last four years with indigenous rights movements is that it has brought forward that Native peoples are not invisible and we participate in civic processes both through protest and through voting. We have the highest number of Native Americans and Native American women in Congress currently uh, because I think it's a fundamental indigenous value to move forward and participate in community. 
but it is very complicated on the U.S. side of things because you, who, you or we, it depends what house you, you live in in that statement. We, us, as Americans took a long time to acknowledge the land was stolen, that it wasn't given over, it wasn't traded for bees and bells and things like that. And so in order to enfranchise the people that the land that you stole it from, you have to admit they were here and you have to admit that you weren't successful exterminating them. And that's a very tricky thing because the thing is, is voting is a right and an obligation, not a privilege. And the landholders of this nation have done everything in their power to make sure the disenfranchised don't get to participate in that process. Um, and withholding the right to vote was one of, and still is the most effective way to control the voting populace today. I have some thoughts about the problem of authoritarianism. And we see that there are certain aspects of some of the things that are going on that I read about in the news right now in the current time, and also um, seeing it in um, authoritarian regimes that seem to be um, having more credence in other parts of the globe. People did elect an authoritarian figure, um, Hitler, and we think that that can't happen again, but it could happen again. I see evidence across the globe of authoritarianism, and it concerns me very much. Anyone who is concerned about authoritarianism knows that that happens when people are limited in their ability to vote. So I go back to the simple statement that for every person in every place, one thing that every person can do is to vote. I vote because there are so many, so many aunts, uncles, tios, tias, abuelitos, abuelitas, aunties, grandkids, cousins, nephews, who, who shouldn't have to die because of racist policies. I vote because children should not have to be locked up and separated from their families. I vote because science should not be fake news. I vote because I want my children to not live in an environmental wasteland. I vote because it truly is a matter of life and death. Please make your voice heard. Whatever it is, whatever tune you sing, make your voice heard because not everyone has the good fortune that we have in this country to be able to exercise that option. And it's important. So please, it's our duty. Let's do it. Join us next time as the Suffrage Special pulls into Bellingham to sing along with Linda Allen. Members of the League of Women Voters will add their voices to our suffrage story. All aboard! <laughs>